This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Rock and Roll Denim, Bill Fick Ford, the WCRA, and Resist All. Guys, another year has ticked by. Challenging year, but there was somebody you could rely on if you needed a new Super Duty pickup, and that was Bill Fick Ford. Once again, the number one Super Duty dealer in the entire country. You guys have seen what's going on in the car business, in the truck business. You're seeing trucks being sold for thousands above MSRP. Well, if you go to Bill Fick Ford, it doesn't matter where you are at in the continental US. He will take care of you. He will stand by the product and he will not take advantage of you. Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the only place you can go in 2022 for a no bull discount. Bill Fick Ford. Are you a rodeo athlete looking for new ways to earn money? The WCRA is all for rodeo and you can be too. How does the WCRA work, you say? How do you earn money, you say? Start by nominating any event you are going to be participating in prior to the performance starting. That is key. You can nominate anything with publicly verifiable results. Team roping, jackpots, 4D barrel races, rep stock only events, pro rodeos, whatever. Basically, any rodeo event counts as long as the event has public and verifiable results. You are eligible to win WCRA points. Right now, you can nominate for the May 11th through the 14th Rodeo Corpus Crispy, where there is a guaranteed $553,000 payout with zero break-in entry fees. There's only one week left to earn points for the Rodeo Corpus Christi leaderboard. Nominations end April 10th. How do you start? Go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the WCRA app on your mobile device. If you already have an account, hit nominate. If not, hit register and create that account. Select your discipline, the date of your ride or run, verify you're nominating the current segment, confirm your payment. Now it's time to compete and earn points. The WCRA team will track your results and points will be awarded if and when you place and earn money. Nominate today and visit us at WCRARodeo.com or on the WCRA Rodeo app for the event information. What sets Resist All apart is the legacy of the cowboys who wear the brand. These traditions are passed down from fathers to sons, from heroes to future champions. Since 1927, Resist All has been handcrafting the finest American-made cowboy hats. Generation after generation, we live it. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we have got the Matt Gaines. Matt is a $9 million plus writer and this is just another one of those educational, real podcasts. This is Probably one of my favorites we've done in the last, you know, last few weeks. And I think there's so much great information. Matt, you know, gives away for free in this one that you'd be stupid not to tune in. But yeah, you come here for, you know, great shows and we try to keep producing them. Check it out. Well, I have to say, I listen to your podcast quite a bit. I like it. You like it? Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. We did a lot of driving last year. So after a while, you get tired of, you run out of music to listen to. You, You know what? I've turned into one of those guys that doesn't listen to music almost hardly yeah. at all. There's so much good stuff. You know, if you're a business guy or something that you can consume, it's like, well, why would I listen to music? Well, it's for me driving it like, you know, listening to podcasts and stuff like that just keeps you more. I don't get as tired, you know, kind of keeps yeah. you more, I guess, a little more stimulated mentally. And yeah, it gets the time <clears throat> moving quicker too. Yeah. Cause you start listening to music like, God damn, that was yeah. only two minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work not when you're driving 16 17 hours yeah, a day no. well Matt, i'm glad that you that you joined us uh, i think there's a lot of different topics that we could probably discuss with a guy like you who's been so successful in your field that uh don't only apply to horses right because you can get kind of bogged down if you just right. start talking it's real it's a real straight path on that it's like well what do you do with the horse this what do you do with right. the horse that and that doesn't apply to everybody really that right. only applies to a real small portion and uh I think what I would like to talk to you about is more, you know, how you maintain success over time for such a long period and, you know, kind of how you approach that because anybody can win once or twice, right? right? But to consistently be on top for a long period of time, that that's a certain type of person that is able to do that. And it's not just with cutting horses or, or, or 
<clears throat> any type of equestrian event, it's literally everything in life, right? right. Whether that be a business or a different sport. And, and I think that, uh, for me, that's kind of what I want this show to turn into. You just kind of just be a haha funny thing, or you get a guy on here who's kind of crude and funny, but it's been real successful. Yeah. You get a lot out of that. <clears throat> but, uh, first and foremost, if you could just kind of tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, you know, and maybe we could talk about your background and how you got to kind of your starting point and then yeah. break into some of those, those finer points. Maybe I'm Matt Gaines. Um, uh, Cutting horse trainer, live in Weatherford, Texas. It's my wife Tara over there that you met a while ago. Yeah, she's the she's the glue that holds everything together. Yeah, and with uh, no coffee, she said no Which, coffee. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, no, she's yeah. yeah, she runs high speed. She doesn't need caffeine. Yeah, what would what would she be like on caffeine? I don't want to know. Axe murderer, maybe. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> I can't keep up with her now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so what the your childhood and like kind of where you came into the cutting horse game and what was all that about? How well, did you get to where? So I, my dad trained cutting horses and actually as a young kid, he was vice president of a bank there in a small town in Byers, Texas. And, but you know, during that time he, uh, he trained his own horses, uh, competed as a non-professional and he had a, a stallion named Doc Tari, which, you know, some people still remember, but he was back, you know, we're talking in the seventies, early eighties, he was one of the bigger stallions in in the cutting horse industry. And in nineteen eighty, I believe it was, he decided he'd quit the bank and uh decided to start training horses professionally and we uh stood that stallion there at our place and you know, he went into it for t- full time, and you know, I was born in '69, so you know, I mean, that around that time, I was getting old enough to, you know, ride and help, and 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 you know, so I just kind of grew up doing it. You know, I, I I was free labor basically, like most ranch kids. That's you damn know? for sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so. You know, I I grew up in it and. You know, did everything from clean stalls, low horses, build fence. You know, I mean everything that oh, bust know, a lot I, of ice in the winter time, well. and you know, yeah. and 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 I never really started showing though till I was. He wouldn't let me show for a long time, and finally, I think maybe I showed the first time when I was eleven or twelve years old, and that's kind of when I, you know, first kind of started showing a little bit, and I I think for me. <clears throat> I would say I had a natural talent, you know, with horses. Like, I, I was always comfortable on a horse, if that makes sense. I don't know, I, you know, natural talent or not, but I was always comfortable on a horse. Like, like that part of it came pretty easy to me, just, you know, the the horse part. Uh, we farmed, too. I hated tractors. I hated any time I had to get on a tractor, and I dang sure didn't want to go to the breeding barn because that was just miles and miles of walking. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I liked the horses. I was comfortable on them. So, you know, like that's where I spent my time was helping with, you know, the working of the horses and that part of it. And, you know, just basically kind of fell in love with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's really kind of intriguing. You, you mentioned, you know, I think talent probably is the right word or connection maybe would be another word with yeah. horses. Cause you see people who, Maybe maybe they have all the money in the world you would want, and they just can't make it click. Doesn't matter right. if it's a five dollar horse or a five million dollar horse. I mean, they they are in your world, they're in the rodeo world, they're in every aspect right. of the you know kind of the Western world. And if you don't have that, you know, it'd be it'd be it'd be like you got somebody like Tiger Woods who started playing golf and just boom, it was there. Right. You got the same people who's playing their whole life, and the best they can do is be like the pro guy or whatever right. at some <laughs> random golf course. So, yeah, I think that that might be one of the biggest defining differences. And I'm clearly work ethic would probably be well, the other one. But, you know, I don't know what I know of your background from listening to the podcast. You know, I mean, you know, when you see people, some people you see on a horse and you're like, they look like they belong there. And then every once in a while you see somebody and it just, you know, they look like a fish out of water up there a little <laughs> bit, you know. and They it, do. And, you know, so I just think that, it, you know, it comes a little more naturally to some than it does others. And. You know, and it and it and it was natural to me. So and and I liked it. So it was just kind of a, you know, it it was a, I guess, kind of a natural co- course for me to take. You know, uh, so so I kind of 
you know, as it once I started showing and and you know, I didn't have much success at first, but kind of started figuring it out and doing it a little doing a little better and he started letting me, you know, show some little better horses and stuff like that and a little more success and you know, then I kind of at that point really started try wanted to learn okay, so how how it all works. It's one thing to show a horse that's trained. It's another thing to, you know, train one that you can go compete and win on. And, you know, so it, at the start, I, I figured out how to show a horse at a young age, but, but the training part of it took a while. In fact, I don't know that I figured it out yet. I think I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was, I mean, what was the more intriguing thing to you, right? And, and I wanted to ask you about your dad too, but I mean, when you're looking at that, what was the more intriguing thing to you—the actual showing of the horse or the whole process of training the horse? Well, I I think both. I I love I love the showing. I love competition. Uh, love to compete, but but I think the training of the horse has always been intriguing to me. Um, you know, it's I you said a while ago connection with a horse. I. To me, to be a a good horse trainer, you have to have you have to be able to have a connection with that horse. I think that's kind of what to me that's what sets your really good trainers in any field. Your really good trainers apart from everybody else because the mecha- anybody can learn the mechanics. I think, but it's the the connection and knowing how far to push one when, when to back off, when, you know, it, it's that kind of, kind of getting in their mind and, and relating to where they're at that really makes a difference, I believe. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you break it down, you're right. There's, there's only, there's only forward, backwards, right, and left. There's two leads. I mean, there's only so much mechanical stuff that goes right. into riding the horse, right? Right. So, yeah, I mean, without those things you're talking about, I mean, you see it all the time. You see whether they're good people or not. I mean, people just run some of the most amazing horses into the ground and they come back and they're just, they're no better than the shoes they're standing right. on. And yeah, not having that connection, I think might be that number one thing. And you know, what's great about, about the Western world. It's also, it kind of sucks at times, but every other sport or every other industry that's based around competition does not have that factor, <clears throat> which is another living creature. Right? right. Yes. So it's a completely different experience to be successful in this you know, as opposed to like a basketball player or something. It's like, it's you and the ball and then other people, you can talk, you can speak, you know, it's, it's very direct. Right. Nothing's direct with horses really. Well, and especially, you know, with cutting, you know, once we get a cow cut, we have to put our hand down, you know, and then at that point you're, you're trying to get a, a horse, a cow and yourself all basically on the same page, on the same page working together, you know? So, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a it's not a simple thing. I always say that it's a simple concept, but the application is really tough sometimes. You know, it's uh, you know, you, the concept of cutting is you separate a cow from a herd and you keep it from going back. Doesn't sound that hard till you start trying to do it. Well, and it's so funny. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at other people in other horse industries, like take a rodeo person like me, for instance, you see cutting, you're like, that looks pretty easy, right? Then you go and you try it, and you're like, nope. Yeah. Nope. It's actually easier to rope them. <laughs> you know I don't know. I mean? I'm not a very yeah. good roper, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, why, why would you have to be, I guess you do what you do, but oh, that, that all makes sense. I wanted to ask you about your dad. You said he was working at a bank. What was it? I mean, was it that he was sick and tired of working for somebody else or was it just that he felt like he needed that passion <clears throat> with the horses? Cause that's where he wanted to I, be. I think that's where I, I remember him saying w- when he decided to leave the bank, that because because he, he would work at the bank and then he'd come home and ride his horses and and I remember him saying that whether he had his day was good or bad depended on how his horses were when he got home from the bank it didn't really have anything to do with the bank and and I think he just got to a point to where he, I, I guess that's really where his passion was too you know that's where his heart was was you know, riding the horses and training the horses and stuff like that. And I I, th- I believe that's what led him to make the decision to, to do it full time. Yeah. And then obviously he inspired you to kind of want to go down that path as well. Well, yes, 
I don't, you know, it's kind of funny. I was all growing up as a kid, you know, uh, like I always helped and, and, and worked hard and, and he would try hard to teach me and I'd try hard to learn. But at the same time, you know, both my parents always told me, look, don't, don't, don't do this for a living. Go to college, get an education, get a real job, you know, do this as a hobby. And, you know, so I, like they were, you know, he was eager to teach me to learn and help me to get better. But at the same time, he kind of tried to push me away from it a little bit. And that, you know, which, you know, now, you know, it's, it's been great to me, but it's a lot of work. It's not the, it's sure not the easiest way in the world to make a living. And, you know, your chances of getting rich doing it are about next to nothing. But, you know, so, I mean, you know, I think like any parent, like, you know, he saw the side of it that that I didn't know yet. Uh, you know, so they, and, and that's what I did. I went to college, got a degree, and I spent a year working for uh, Dennis Moreland Cowboy Tack <clears throat> right out of college, and you know, tried that, and it, it was it was good. It was a good education. It was a good experience, but I, my heart just wasn't in it. I, I wanted to be riding horses, and, and I never will forget the day I called my dad, and I told him, I said, look, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit this job here, and I'd found a place where in Mississippi where I could go train horses. And he said, well, he said, if that's what you want to do, he said, he, he, he said two things. He said, work really hard and don't do anything for free. And, you know, and that's kind of how I got started. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's really great <clears throat> advice. I mean, how many people do you know who get stuck just being the buddy and helping everybody out with their horses and they never, they never get out of the well, the horse trailer? Well, I, I should have listened to the don't do anything for free part a little better. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like I listened to your podcast with Clinton, you know, yeah. both of them. and. You know, and it, it, I mean, the Western industry is kind of that way, and, and, and which in a way is cool, right? Like, you know, like there was a bunch of people that was always willing to help me, and, and I'm always willing to help the people I can help, and, you know, but, but at the same time, you, you know, I think we do compromise our value sometimes in doing that, but yeah. It is kind of just the good old boy aspect of the Western world, though, right? right? Yeah, I mean, no. and, and that's what's really great. It's like if you wanted to play baseball, good luck getting anywhere near who the equivalent of you would be in that sport. You're right. not going to have access to them at all. But somebody, kid, could come up to you and ask you for a couple of tips, and, you know, they can, one, get to where you're at, and, two, you'll give it to them. And that's one of the things that I love about this is is there is accessibility. Right. I think at some point, I would love to see it grow big enough where that accessibility is more limited, just like everything else, just because I think the industry and the people deserve, you know, kind of a more heightened level of value for the work. I mean, you've dedicated at this point, how many years into, into oh, your craft? Gosh. So when I've started training, when I started training professionally was in 90, I think about this 90, 93, I think. So however long that's been 30 years, almost. Mm -hmm. I could tell yeah. you yeah. <laughs> it's 30 just yeah. about. So, so yeah. So, you know, and that's not counting the time I spent, you know, as a kid growing up around it too. That's just, you know, doing it as, as a professional. Yeah. But, but when I, when I started, when I made the decision to, that that's what I was going to do for a living. At that point, I'd never even trained a horse from start to finish. I didn't even know if I could. I just knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I really kind of, you know, put myself out there and was like, you know, you're either going to figure this out or you're not. And, you know, luckily for me, it worked out. But Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, to win – to have winnings that, that accrue into the nearly ten million dollar range, I mean that's that's the absolute apex of the Western world. No matter where you get it, I mean the the highest earning rodeo guy seven million, right? You know right. the the PBR guy, it's right there. You're right there. I mean that's almost at least from what we've seen in the modern world, that's about the ceiling, right? Right. And there's very few people who achieve that. And 
what was the process for you when you realized you could be successful to where you could marginalize that success and then duplicate it enough to where we could even be having a conversation about that type of, of winning? Well, I think to start with, I'm going to tell you a little story of, of when, <laughs> when I first decided to train cutting horses professionally. The, the very first show I went to was in Abilene, Texas, and uh, I went just to – to show a couple of horses of my dad's that he couldn't show. And, <clears throat> and Greg Welch, who, uh, you know, everybody in our industry knows, uh, passed away several years ago. But, but he was always, as a kid growing up, when I'd show, if he was there, he'd always turn back for me and he'd help me. And, and Greg always loved kids and, and, and he loved picking on them. And he, and he, you know, he liked picking on me and, and stuff like that. But I never will forget at that show, uh, and everybody had heard that I'd turned my non-pro card in and stuff, and he came up to me, and and he and it was kind of funny. We were just passing each other, and he stopped me, and he said, what? He said, what in the hell are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? He said, why would you turn your non-pro card in? And I said, well, I said, I want to do this. I can't really afford to do it as a non-professional. And I said, you know, and I really just want to know if I'm good enough or can be good enough to compete with y'all. And he looked at me and he said, you're not, and you never will be. And I thought, and I remember thinking, I thought, well, you son of a bitch, I'll show you, you know, and that was really kind of, and, uh, you know, looking back, that was one thing that really kind of built a fire in me to, you know, I think it was that point. I'm like, I don't know how good I'll get, but I'm going to show them that I can be good enough. And, you know, and I've kind of always been that kind of person where, you know, if somebody told me I couldn't do something, I, I'd try to prove that I could, you know. I mean, instead of that being a deterrent, it was kind of like throwing gas on a fire. Yeah. Well, and that's, <clears throat> if you kind of look at, like, the dichotomy of people who win or achieve, there's kind of two personality types, right? There's the back the hell up and the get the hell in. Right. And what you find is everybody who has really achieved some level of success has a similar situation where they're like, oh, hell no, I'm going to prove you wrong. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest factors, right? Because if you have that moment and then you go through with that, every time you incur a barrier, you find a way to climb over it instead of sit down and make your camp behind that wall. Right. But I, I think what people need to understand and, you know, I mean, that was that was the, I think that was the spark that really, you know, it, it really kind of got under my skin and, and lit a fire under me. But then, you know, the process of getting to where, getting to that point. Now, that's a whole other thing. Because you got to follow through. Yeah, well, I mean, there's just, you know, there there's so much to, what what I've learned over the years there's so much to learn about training a horse, showing a horse, and and a big part of it is your mental state of mind. Like you know, being confident, and 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 it you know it's hard to be confident in yourself when you've never had any success, right? Like that that's a hard thing, but it's hard to have much consent much success until you're confident in yourself. So. You know, and and I think for me that was a big part of, you know, learning how to mentally be confident in myself, teach myself to be confident in in what I was doing, no matter what anybody else was saying or what else was going on, but being confident in what I was doing, still open to listen, but being confident in what I was doing, I think really helped me. Yeah, let's break that down a little bit. I mean, how did you keep yourself centered like that and, and maintain that confidence? I mean, I can just, I can think of, of times where it's you get knocked down so easy in this industry, and, and it's really hard to maintain that focus. I right. mean, I'm a guy who threw my hands up and said, "Forget that." Yeah. So, well, and it, and it is it is hard, uh, and you know, I, I I guess really I have Paul Hansma, which. You wouldn't know this, but most people in our industry know that once once I started training horses for a living and 
And the guy I was working for at the time, Charles Spence, actually bought a ranch right across the road from Bar H where Paul and Winston Hansen trained. And I worked with them a lot and and talked to Paul a lot. And at that time, he was, you know, he was probably the hottest guy in our industry. And, uh, you know, and he, he gave me some tapes to listen to. And I, I can't remember the guy's name now. I think it's Jim Lair or John. He was a tennis coach, basically. Mm. But, but, it, but he was... You know, he had gotten into these, uh, you know, had these tapes on, I guess, mental toughness and mental attitude and competition and stuff like that. And Paul gave me a couple of those tapes, and I mean, and I would listen to them over and over and over, you know, and just really trained my mind to, you know, it, it was a lot about your subconscious and how – you know, like if somebody said, hey, you know, do good later or, you know, is your response, I'll try or I will or, you know, what is your response to that? Is it a positive spo- response or a negative, you know, or a negative Absolutely. response? And it, it and, and that really helped me. And, you know, without trying to sound cocky, I mean, I'll, I just, I've gotten <clears throat> a real good habit of, you know, when somebody said something along those lines, I'm like, yeah, I'll do good, you know, like, and. You know, and it, it was amazing to me after a while. Boy, you really start to believe it. You know, I knew every time I went down there, I went down there, I was going to do good. And if I didn't, so what? Yeah. You know, but but it, it, it for me, learning that really helped give me some, you know, some confidence within myself that, you know, I just, I just, that I just knew I was going to do good. And, you know, it, it's kind of hard to explain, and it sounds kind of a little woo-woo, but, but it, you know, but it, it, it really helped me. Working on the mental aspect of that really helped me a lot. You know what's funny <clears throat> is, and I say that woo-woo all the time about anything that's not just straightforward, right. but the more, like, you achieve or the more that you reflect on what you have achieved – you realize that like that woo woo stuff is like 99% of it. And people in our industry are pretty sold up and they don't want to talk about stuff like that usually. But that's what I think is so amazing about people like yourself and, and people like Clinton and, and, and ton, there's tons of people out there who would be willing to talk about that stuff. But it, it is kind of everything, right? Like ev- everybody you talk to who's successful, not just here, it's everything is a mental battle. Right. I think we're born with a mental battle and we die with a mental battle. I just think seven days a week, 365 days a year, you just, you're battling mentally. Maybe you don't want to get up. Maybe you don't want to go ride 15 head of horses right. now that you've, you know, which is another question. How do you not get complacent once you've been so successful? Well, and, and, and like I said, you know, I said a while ago, like, you know, it's not always easy to have that positive attitude. And and I think for me, it was more important early on, you know, because like I said, how do you, it's, it's almost like I had to trick myself into thinking I was good enough before I was. Does that make sense? Like It, it does, yeah. yeah. Because, you, you know, if you don't have, like, so in our business, you know, if you're, if you're training horses, well, you're training horses for the public. Well, if you're not confident in yourself, how's anybody else going to be confident enough in you to pay you to train their horse and go show it? So, you you know, so, I mean, you've got to, you know, I felt like I had to find a way to to basically trick myself into being confident that, hey, I I can do this. And, and, And a lot of that was I was willing to do whatever it took to make it happen. You know, uh, mistakes are made, and you know you learn from them, and you and you keep pushing forward. And, and I, you know, to me, that's probably the two biggest things: is one reaching success, and then maintaining success is having a good mental attitude, but also understanding that you know what it it there's going to be times it sucks. There's going to be times that you're going to want to – I've told her before, like, I ought to quit and go sell cars or something. Like, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. You know, that I've been that, you know, knocked down, knocked down, knocked down, 
and you get to where you're just like, man, I just, I, you know, maybe I don't have it anymore. Like, you know, so, I mean, I've been in that spot too, but, but you just, you know, but, but I think, and I, and I think that goes to also if, if what you do for a living is your passion and it's really what you love, it's a lot easier to push through those times. And, you know, and, and you've got to do that. You've got to, you know, because you're going to get knocked down. And then you might get knocked down again. And you might get knocked down several times before you get back on your feet and you're standing firm again. But but you've got to just keep pushing through, keep pushing through, try to figure out what it is that's got you in the spot you're in and work through those times till it gets better. And, you know, so, I mean, a lot of it's just perseverance. Yeah. It's the stuff people don't necessarily want to hear. You know, they want to know what, what the quick fix is or what the overnight secret is. Yeah. And there yeah. isn't one. There is no quick fix. And, and I don't think in anything, you know, maybe if you're lucky and win the lottery or something, but. Yeah, but then you hear, like, what is it, like 88% of the people who win the lottery go broke within yeah. the decade, the same decade they get the money? Yeah. I mean, so you that know. that doesn't work. Like, I, I believe to be successful in anything, I mean, it's it's trial and error. It's perseverance. It's being confident in yourself, and it's just pushing through. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, and you have to have a certain level of talent. I think that's a given. But, but I think – you know, I've also always been a believer that I don't care who you are. If you want something bad enough, you can find a way. That may not mean, may not mean you're the very best at what you do, but you can find a way to be successful. Guys, rock and roll denim has absolutely changed the game when it comes to the performance and style in Western jeans. Top competitors like Shad, Tim O'Connell, Shelly Morgan, you name it. Your boy right here. We're all wearing rock and roll denim inside and outside of the arena. It gives you the flexibility you need to win as well as looking absolutely great in your interviews, appearances, whatever it is you're doing. Even you're just doing podcasts like me. I had a chance to go to Rock and Roll Denim's factory the other day and pick out all the pants I wanted. Here's the thing. I got to try on a bunch of their new jeans. I love the men's revolver jeans with the reflex stretch technology because they're comfy. They're not stiff like some of the other jeans. Go check them out at rockandrolldenim.com or follow Rock and Roll Denim on Facebook and Instagram for the newest trends in Western fashion. Rockandrolldenim.com. Yeah, and for you, what was that exact thing that you you personally wanted? Was it, you know, because, I mean, there's only so many things you can get out of life what was the number one thing that you wanted personally well i th- i think to be- i think to begin with like i just wanted <laughs> well you know the first thing when i first started training i wanted to prove to myself that i could actually train a horse to cut <laughs> cuz i didn't even know if i could do that but then <laughs> but you know and then like so this is going to be a long answer to the question you asked me but it's a long show <laughs> but but you know so so that was kind of my first goal was all right, let's see if I can train one to cut. And then, you know, then, well, I, I did that. I went to a couple small futurities. I was training horses in Mississippi, and the horses I had weren't that good. But I had, like, four three-year-olds that year, got them trained to cut, went to a couple small shows out there, made some finals. And, you know, and I'm like, so at the end of that year, I'm like, well, okay, so I know now I can train one to cut good enough that I can have – a little bit of success at a small level. And then I, so, so then I looked at it and I was like, okay, so now that, that I know I can train these horses to cut, I look at them. Now, what would have made them better? What, what can I do to this next group to make them better? And that's kind of how I, and I kind of did that year after year. And, and then you know that, and and then the next year I did a little better, and then the next year I did a little better, and then people start noticing that, hey, you know this kid's doing a pretty good job, and then they start sending you a little better horses, and you know, and it just kind of builds, and you know, so I, you know the early goals that was the, you know, the early goals was just trying to prove to myself that I could actually do this, 
And then once I kind of had a little, you know, success, then it's, you know, then it goes to, you know, for most of my life, I've been an age event guy, which, you know, and in our sport, we have age events. And then, uh, you know, our world champion is, you know, we call them weekend shows, but, you know, and that's kind of more like the rodeo, yep, you know, deal to go in. We have the world finals and all that. And I've primarily been an age event guy, uh, but, you, you know, so so early on it was, you know, so I kind of got a few things under my feet there at a smaller level, and then it was, all right, so I want to make the finals at maturity and, and, and stuff like that because that's our biggest show. And, you know, and it just kind of builds, and then, you know, I I got on a roll. I had a lot of – Really good horses there over a seven, eight, nine year period, and you know, and everything got to clicking, and then the goals started getting bigger, and you know, and and you know, and that's when I got to thinking, well, you, you know, I th- I think the I think the main thing in our sport that everybody wants to win is the maturity. Like that's that's the biggest deal in our industry, and. And for a long time, I had won everything but that, and some of them more than once. And, you know, had, I don't know, two or three horses of the year and, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and I was, but I was always, I was always okay. I, like, I was always good with that because I think for me, like now I've won the futurities and I'm, I'm glad I did, and it was awesome. It, for me, it was kind of like, you know, the monkey off your back kind of thing because that was the one thing I hadn't won. But, but even before that, you know, my like the most important thing to me is I I wanted to put out a good product every year. You know, it wasn't as important. I always looked at the futurity as the futurity as one show. It was kind of like you said, anybody can win once, and. You know, but I always wanted to – my goal was to have horses that were good at good at maturity and then got better through throughout the year and, you know, and, and put together a good record on all the horses throughout the year. So, I mean, you know, my goal was uh, – it wasn't so much one specific win or one specific show oriented. It was more – as a group, you know, you know, I guess you'd say, you know, for for many years there, my goal was to be the number one money winning guy every year. You know, I, I took more pride in that than any one show I won because, you know, you look at that. Well, you know, you were successful all year, not just one time or one show. So I mean, that was kind of, you know, that was kind of my once I kind of got rolling and 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 felt comfortable and and stuff like that that was kind of my goal every year yeah yeah that makes sense i mean that's really that's dominance if you look at it throughout the year yeah now true but i mean it takes you know it it you got to have good horses i don't care if you're riding cutting horses or barrel horses or roping or you got to have the horse or you know you can't do it so you know it takes a lot of a lot of really good horsepower, and I was fortunate that, you know, I had some good owners that believed in me and gave me good horses to ride, and, you know, so that's a, you know, that's a huge part of it as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's a difficult part, right? Because, I mean, it's tough to weed out which ones are going to be great and which ones aren't. Yeah, Yeah, you know, and it's, I was all, I've always kind of been the guy, like, I, it was hard for me to send one home. Right. You know, because it, it, to me, even if I knew that horse wasn't good enough, I, f- I always felt like if I sent it home, I yeah, I failed as, you know, on my job. Like, you know, was not getting it trained to where, but, but you know, but you got to look at it too where you reach a point to where, you know, the, the guy that owns a horse is wasting money. You know, and but I just, you know, I think part of a little bit of fear of mine was, well, what if I send it home, it goes to somebody else and, you know, right. it ends up being a really good horse. So, you know, I was kind of, 
I've kind of always been one. Like I would give one, I would make sure I gave one a really good chance, you know, before I was kind of like, you know what, this, I just don't think this one's going to make it. And, you know, and so, so, I mean, I've always kind of, you know, like tried to make sure before I made that call, this one just isn't good enough. But I think things have changed too in the last 20 years for sure the horsepower at our events is so much stronger than it was then you know back 15 20 years ago if you could take a pretty good horse get it really trained and you might not win an event but you could go make a lot of finals <clears throat> and today it's not that way like you better have a really good horse and, uh, you know, so it's, it's probably easier now, like to know, you know, those horses show you pretty early on, at least talent wise, like, you, you know, pretty early, you know, this horse either has a talent or it doesn't. I think the thing that's hard about with cutting is it takes a little while sometimes to know if they're going to, going to be smart enough, you know, the talent's easy to recognize, but you know, sometimes it takes a little longer to know, you know, hey, is this horse really going to be smart enough to be a really good horse? Right. Yeah, and that's one of the <clears throat> interesting and, and kind of fun things about cutting horses is the horse, it's not as automatic as some other things. I mean, they really do have to think quite a bit, especially for, you know, a flight animal. Right. Which is, it's kind of fantastic, especially if you don't know the sport as well as someone like you would. If you understand that, it's it's actually like it's fantastic thing to watch like you can't get bored watching it because every horse approaches it a little different well every horse and then you know trainers too it, it's kind of funny it's you know we're we're all trying to do the same thing but we all go about it a little different you know so that, that's kind of interesting you know too when you sit back and watch it and there's you know there's lots of different styles that work and win and and stuff like that, and same way at the horses too, you know. But so, yeah, it. But I think that's kind of one thing that keeps it a little bit fresh and interesting, and you know, all that kind of stuff. As far as a fan, if you, and you know, if you if you love horses, it's it's hard not to watch a really good cutting horse and appreciate what they do. Yeah. So. Hundred percent. I mean, if you're a horseman and you see what it takes for one of them to break down the way they do. I mean, it's, it's just amazing to watch. It's just like you could probably go and appreciate the Kentucky Derby. It's amazing oh, to see yeah. that. Yeah. We actually well, went a few years ago. Did that you really? Was, oh man, it was awesome. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's such a wild <laughs> experience. Yeah. Especially yeah. for a Western person. That's, that's a whole nother level of equestrian people. <laughs> it's just yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a completely different world. That's, I think that's the thing that blew me away about it was it's, it's it's horses, right? But it's a completely different world from, you know what what we're in. But it, but it was really cool to to go and see, and and you know we kind of got to go behind the scenes a couple different places and see some stuff, and 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 it, yeah, it was really fascinating. I really really enjoyed it. I don't know about you, but I've always <laughs> wondered like what is it that separates like those old English type of equestrian events from from the western is it just that we're so far behind or they're just so much more quote-unquote eclectic i mean there's some just giant mainstream sponsors who sponsor horse racing and polo i mean you're talking rolex and Hermes and these brands that they wouldn't even look your wife she's shaking her head she knows yeah i have yeah. One, i have one of you too but uh th like they don't touch anything in the western world and i've always wondered it's like how do you bottle that up and get that level of person interested in what we do as well well I, I don't know. I think there's a complex answer to that. Like, I I think in a lot of ways we hold ourselves back, and 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 this is just my opinion, but I I feel like you know cutting for sure, but I think pretty much in the Western industry. Not I mean I don't know if this applies to rodeo so much, but but the Western horse show industry we've diluted our product way too much explain that well i think we got to you know like it all starts with embryo transfers and getting 
you know, five, six babies out of a mare every year. And, you know, so you take some of the greatest brood mares. Well, so you get, say they have four babies a year. Well, what if they had one? What's that one worth every year? Right. You, you, you see what I'm saying? And, 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 and I think even with our shows, I think, you know, except for the three shows in Fort Worth, like guys can show as many horses as they want to. So like, you know, it, it, it kind of, it, it's kind of, you know, more is not always better kind of thing. I think that, that we, you, you know, you kind of shrink the pool of people that were involved and, and you devalue the horses in a sense. And, and to me, you kind of, you kind of devalue the whole, the whole industry when, when you look at it. I mean, you look at race horses and, you know, stuff like that. You know, there's no embryo transfer. There, it, you, you know, you can't, I mean, they're like thoroughbreds. It's a live cover. And, you know, so I mean, I, I think, I think there's a, which I think goes to prestige a little bit. Like, I think the integrity and the prestige, you know, maybe I think they've held that together maybe in that industry better than what we have. And I don't know that because I really don't know that much about it. That's just, you know, from the outside guy looking in, you know, that's that would be some things I see that maybe, you know, puts them apart because, like, you know, like a lot of the – you know, like those jumping shows and stuff, as far as money, what they win, they don't really win any money much. Yeah. But those horses are sell for some of them millions of dollars. Yeah. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, I wish I did know for sure what it was and we could fix it and make our industry more that way. But I, you know, I think there's, I think there's a lot of things that go into it from what I said to, you know, also the, you know, the Western culture of the, good old boy and, and and all that i mean it, and it it's great in a lot of ways but i think it holds us back in a lot of ways and it, the the <laughs> relationship that the western world has with money is is really strange right it's almost like there's a negative connotation with it right you know what i mean like you get you get so stuck in kind of there's like if you look at the other industry we're talking about the other equestrian industries i mean it's very obvious everyone's extremely affluent you can't even there's no such thing as a, a leisure ride on a Kentucky Derby horse, right? Or even right. that level. You don't just get to have that and do that on the weekends, right? And the whole market with Western horses, call them saddle horses, which is what those people call them, but is being able to package that up and sell it to a weekend warrior type consumer, for lack of a better term. I know some people hate that phrase, weekend warrior, but someone who does not do it for a living, right? Right, is them that you want them to go to the show see those winners and then they want to pay for pay for that stud fee they want to you know go to the clinics or buy the saddles and i mean it's all based around that so is it it's not necessarily catered to the performance in the horse if you really think about it it's it's tailored to the consumer right what's the number one thing that that's always mentioned about a horse who wins well it's the sire right Right. so that they can promote that sire so they can make the money to continue doing it and if you really just look at it there's kind of two ways you can make money in business, right? Let's say you've got a product. It, it's very high margin, like a real luxury item. I mean, they don't sell a lot of a Patek Philippe watch or something like that, or a really high end car like a Bugatti. They don't sell very many of them, right? But their margin is so high that it covers their entire. Well, <clears throat> yeah, and and kind of what you're hitting on, like I I've wondered about about this in our sport and maybe the entire Western industry when you look at it is and and maybe you've really hit it on the head there is you know we've always tried to sell cutting as a sport for everybody to compete in and 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 we do have a lot of different levels but at the high level like it takes a lot of money huge like, huge sum I mean, of money you know and I and I've kind of I've wondered at times like man I wonder if we'd have been better off and trying to set instead of trying to sell it as, you know, hey, everybody can play this game to, you know, no, everybody can't play this game. Because I think that kind of hits on what you're 
It, what what it you're does. saying? Yeah, because the two ways that you, you there is high margin on you know very select pr- amount of product, or there's the Chevrolet model or something right. like that. There's low margin, high volume. Everybody can have a Chevrolet. Right. Only a few motherfuckers can and, have a Bugatti. Right, and and you know, and if you're smart, you can do both. Like you know, you like you and, can, and, and I and I think we've tried to do that. Like you know, with the weekend cutting and, and and try to have a place for everybody to cut. And I feel like we've probably done better on that side of it than we have from making the 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 more prestigious, the big side of it yeah. even more that way. I think is maybe where we've lost out a little bit. I think so. I mean, <clears throat> and it may be upsetting for people to hear that, but they have to understand someone who does this as a profession is going to have a different opinion of somebody who wants to do it on the weekends. And I think it's okay to have both perspectives, right? Well, it's like me. Like, I love to play golf. Yeah. I'm never going to get to play at the Masters. Right. You know, but that doesn't mean I, I still like to go play golf. And, and you know, and so, I mean, I think you, you know, there's a way to, there's a way to have that. But, and, and I think we've done, a, I think we, I really do feel like we've done as good a job as we can trying to make it as inclusive as we can. I just don't know that we've done as, but I feel like we've tried to do that with the very upper end of it too. And I'm yeah. not, I'm not sure that I'm not sure maybe that was the best way to go. And that's just my opinion. I don't think but, it is. Cause it's not just cutting. It's the others too. Right. You know, I- anybody can buy a pro card, right. Right. And fill a permit and go to the rodeos, which that's okay. But at the same time, you're going to, you're going to talk to the absolute top, top rodeo people. And they're going to say the same thing as you. In fact, they have right in that same seat. Right. And so what you find is you've got all the people at the top who would like to see it maybe a little different. Maybe it just has to be segmented off. I'm not sure what the secret sauce is to make all that work, but right. I think talking about it and and kind of creating theories and maybe hypotheses on how it could go, I think it's really valuable. That's probably the first steps to getting it there. Oh, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, you got to t- toss ideas around and, and you know, and different things. And, and I think, you know, like I've listened, like I said, I've listened to your podcast quite a bit with different people and, and, and and I think I think right now is a, a pretty exciting time for you know rodeo and cutting and cow horse and right and you know the whole deal. I mean, when you look at with what Taylor Sheridan's doing with Yellowstone and you know the Teton Ridge guy and a lot of the stuff they're trying to do, you know, I think there's there's I think the whole industry is getting a little more exposure than than it's ever had and people are kind of you know the general population is maybe a little more into hey maybe it's cool to be a cowboy again which which always helps and you know so i mean i think there's going to be some like i think there's some opportunities now and hopefully upcoming you know for things to maybe take a a big step forward i just hope that you know we're smart enough to to grasp hold of it and make it happen yeah, and it's really scary because if you've got to spend time in the outside world and like been around successful people who aren't from this industry, if you tell them that you're a cowboy, right, and they ask you, you you go to a let's say you go to a some event for high highly achieving people, and everybody's doing. I think Clinton might have he's done stuff like this, I and mean, anyway, he he talks about this stuff at, at nauseum almost because he's just so good right. at talking. But uh, you know, most people are gonna immediately write you off for your profession. Right. You may be sitting next to the same guy with the same rose gold yacht master on his wrist that you've got. Right. And it's going to be perceived just from who you are that he's far more successful. And he probably is. Maybe he (laughs) is. But even if he's not, it's still going to be perceived that way. Right. And that's what I don't like. It's like we should have people like you who are at the upper echelons being included in these conversations to help influence like the next segment of people coming up in the world. Right. And like, if you can, if you can be successful in this, you should, anybody should be able to walk on the street. Let's say they want to open up a, I don't know, a car wash. They want to do some kind of a business thing. They should be able to come in, listen to somebody like you or Clinton or whoever, and get the same value that you get from the tennis guy or from listening to Gary V or Tony Robbins. But we haven't done a good enough job of promoting our people. And I'm saying just the whole industry to where right. they mm-hmm. seem that valuable to where they can provide that to the whole world. Right. And they are. Well, and I, you know, and I, and I feel confident in saying this, like, I, I, I don't care if you're a cutting horse guy, a rainer, 
cow horse guy, rodeo guy. If if you've had a good bit of success in any anything in the western industry, you've worked your ass off. You've been through a lot of ups and downs. You've learned what it takes to win and 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 you've learned to you know push through a lot of hard times and and there's a lot of value I think that the general public can get out of that 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 nobody gets that, and that's exactly <laughs> right that's why this show even exists is because there's so many principles and core values that you have to have to you can't you can't get real lucky and hit levels of success like you've hit or, you know, other greats in their respected industries. Cause you can't, cause it just takes so many duplications of that to reach that level. Right. Right. It, it just does. Like a guy can get drafted in the NFL, get a $30 million contract, be set for the rest of life. And he can bust out the next year where he's not, you know, worth a piss really. Right. You see it a lot, but you can't do that in this because the, the single transactions aren't big enough. Well, and I think in, and, like, I enjoy talking to, to, you know, kids about this. And I say kids, I'm talking about, you know, teenagers, basically. Because I remember, and I, I don't know if everybody is this way, but, you know, I remember growing up and, you know, whether it was when I was playing football or basketball or whatever, you know, and you'd see somebody that was really good and you're like, you know, man, like, you know, or even, you know, cutting, you know, I'm like, man, like, how do you get to that how do you get to that level? You know, it seems so far beyond what was even achievable. You know, you're kind of like, man, what what is it that, you know, are they just were they just born that good, or you know, I mean, what is it that, you know, how do you, how do you get from here to there, and you know, and I and I think a lot of I think a lot of people, like you say, they're they're looking for that you know, the secret, the, uh, you know, what's the one thing that's going to be easy that's going to get me there, and, and that doesn't exist in any of it, I don't think. Nothing. And, you know, and I, and I think, you know, especially in today's world of everybody gets a trophy and, you know, kids don't learn that whatever it is you want to do in life, you've got to set goals and you've got to work and and it takes time and it takes work and it takes perseverance and it takes failing and learning from the failing and keep pushing forward and and over time if you stick with your goals and you work hard and you do what it takes you get there it's not nobody's born great people that are great they might have been born with talent but the ones that are great they're like made. They 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 wanted it bad enough to do what it took to get there, and that's what you know. And 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 I just you know I just know myself as a as a young kid like I didn't realize that, and I don't think I realized that until the day Greg Welch looked at me and told me I wasn't good enough. I think that was the the trigger that it took for me to be like, okay, like I know what I got to do. And, you know, so, uh, you know, so I guess back to what we were talking about. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of value in what you were saying that people can learn from guys like us or, you know, the rodeo guys or just people in the Western industry. I think they can because it's a hard path. It's a very hard path. And, and if you can do it, that can transition into anything. Like if, if you can be successful at what you're doing, if you decided to drop it tomorrow and you wanted to open up a car lot, I bet you within three years, you'd be the best used car sales lot in the entire area because you know what it takes to get from point. I suck ass to right. I'm going to be remembered for doing this for the rest of my life at minimum. Right. And it goes back to, you have to decide you know, people aren't just built a certain way. You you build yourself, right? And and your background, some people might have a certain head start, but a lot of people who have that silver spoon at the beginning or they don't have that correct mindset, they may have that, like, what looks like success, but it actually belonged to somebody else. Right. 
they're never going to hit the level of fulfillment a from scratch guy or a guy who just makes a decision to persevere has. Because I don't think it's the destination. I've been guilty of this. So you might have been at certain times where you're looking for destination happiness. Where you think, well, once I get this, it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be happy. And then you just continue on that path over and over. And, you know, whatever that goal might be, you get it and you're like, fuck, that did not yeah. feel like what I thought it would. Yeah. And so it turns out that it's that that shit that you have to dig through every day to get there. That's the part that you actually want. Right. Which means that's purpose. So if you lack purpose, you're never going to be fulfilled. Right. And, and everybody says that who's successful. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I remember when I was younger thinking, boy, you know, once I, you know, win these shows or I win this amount of money, boy, this is all going to get easier. No. Never gets easier. In fact, I, I'm not sure it doesn't get harder because, you know, like now you you look at today versus 15 years ago in our industry, you know, like I said, there's just more, there's more good horses and there's more good trainers. So it's just gotten tougher and, and nobody gives a shit what you won last year. It's what are you going to do now? You know, so I mean, it, you, you like if you compete for a living, you can't ever, you can't ever back off. Like you have to, if if you're going to stay competitive, you have you have to keep, you know. Like I'm 53 years old now. Well, you know, like I still got to work as hard at it as the 25 year old guys. If I want to stay competitive, yeah, maybe I have a little bit of advantage and experience and and stuff like that, but. But that doesn't mean I can sit on the couch all day and still get the job done. Like, you know, they're, you know, those guys are hungry. And, you know, I've always said success breeds failure and failure breeds success. I mean, like, and, you know, it's then, and what I mean by that, like, you know, when you've reached a level of success, it's easy to get complacent and you quit working as hard. But, you know, when you fail, you know, I think for me, the failures have always been what's pushed me on to my next success. You know, that once you, you know, want, like the Futurity, for instance, once I finally won the Futurity, I mean, it was awesome. That was good. It was a great feeling. And, you know, I, I was glad that, you know, because that was the one major show I hadn't won. Like, I was glad to, to get that done. But... You know, then how'd next, you feel the next morning? Well, what that's what I say, and then the next month, you know what? There's another eight. There's another show to go to. So, like, you know, who cares what you did last month? So you won the maturity. How are you going to do it this one? That's what everybody. I mean, that's what matters. That's right. And you know, so you can't. You know, and I, and I, I just believe I, it's this way. What no matter what you do, if you compete for a living, you, you don't. There's never a win. A anything that is like, boy, I got that done. Now I can rest. There is no rest if you want to stay competitive. Like you know, and and you know what? When you, I think, I think when you get to the point to where you're ready to to have that rest, it's probably time to start thinking about hanging it up. You know, because it's just it's hard. It you know, like it takes. It takes that work and that perseverance and that continual effort because you may not be doing it, but all these other guys are, and you think you're going to beat them, you're not going to do it. Right. Yeah, There's at some point, if it's competition, you are going to hit a point of no return. Right. Which, you know, brings on to kind of the next topic or the next question maybe I'd ask you before we start kind of wrap up is, you know, how do you set your life up to make sure that you're in a good position for that, right? Because that is a thing that people seem to mess up a it's, lot. It's it's hard. It's hard in what we do. I think it's hard in the Western industry, uh, no matter what you do. You know, like I've heard you on here with other people, you know, talk about some of the most successful rodeo guys, you know, that world champions, multiple world champions that, you know, are – I mean, maybe not 
completely down and out, but they, you know, like they can't retire. Uh, their body's beat up and, you know, and, and, uh, and I think that's a, you know, it's, it's a hard thing. Like there is no retirement program for a Western athlete, really. There's not. I mean, you, you have to create one and, and, and that's what I've tried to do. And, and I'm not there yet. I'm still working on it, but, uh, you know, I, I think for for me, if I was going to tell a you know a, a young a young person in this industry, probably the best thing I did was buy a place. Now I I wouldn't want to buy another training facility now. I sold mine a few years ago, but but that's the one thing you know you buy a place and and. And there's value in that. That's maybe, you know, for, for a horse trainer anyway, that may be the one thing you truly have value in is your property. And, you know, and, and <clears throat> so, I mean, I think if, if, you know, for a young person, if you have an opportunity to do that, I, w- I would do that. I think that's one safe place to put your money and, you know, what years down the road it'll pay you back. Um, but... But it, it's hard, and we were talking about earlier about, you know, business guys. Anybody that look any successful business guy that looks at a training horse operation has to think we're the dumbest people alive because nobody would run a business the way. Well, they do, and you know they do because you're trying to convince them to give you money. But but I mean, yeah, but, not you necessarily, but in right, general, the horse but, trainer. But you know the and and. And I, I, we've all done it the same way because I guess it's how it was originally started. You know, we all charge, you know, uh, whatever the amount is of money to we're, – we're hoping to make enough money off the training to pay the, to get all the bills paid. And then hopefully we win enough. To, you know, our portion of the winnings to make up the rest, and maybe if we do really good, we make a little money. I, instead of charge enough to make a good living training horses, get a smaller percentage of what you win. Like, you know, that's a, you know, you win, so you win the charity, you win a couple hundred thousand. Maybe you get 20% of that. You know, that's a pretty good bonus. But, but you're not relying on that to feed your family or keep things rolling. And, you know, and it's just, to me, we, we do it so backwards. It's just, you know, we'd be better off charging $3,500 a month to train a horse and not getting any of the win or whatever that amount I was. mean, by the time you annualize it, it's to say you got 15 head for the whole year. Yeah. Sure, that extra money sure is a heck of a lot more than the – you know, the 20% or, or some people get 30 or some people get less, depends on whatever your agreement with the owner is. But, you know, it's not the same. Right. Yeah, but, it's less money no matter how you do it. But, you know, my, my, my point is is what is nobody nobody really charges enough to, to make a living just off training the horses. You know, we, 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 hope, we hope we make enough to get the bills paid and then hopefully – we can win enough or sell some horses or something to to cover everything else. So I mean, you know, my my point is like, I don't, I know you have another business. I don't know what it is, but like, you know, if if it's selling cars, for instance, you're not going to sell cars for what they cost you, and then hoping you're going to make it up. You know, you got to make money. Like, uh, you know, so I don't know. I just I feel I, I, I look at I look 100%. at it. I'm just shaking my head. I'm like. You know, we're operating in the hole, hoping we can win enough to get out of the hole all the time. Yeah. And, you know, and that's and, the mindset across the board. Right. Everybody has that same mindset. And they're too scared. I mean, I think Clinton said it or someone said it, too scared to raise their prices because, well, someone else isn't going to raise their right. prices. So it's almost like a collective switch has to happen where right. everybody just agrees this is what we're going to do. Right. Easier said than done. Yeah. Again, no. you keep talking about it, maybe something happens. Yeah. But it, it, but it is kind of funny, and like you know, and Clinton, you know, I mean, he, he, you know, he touched on it. I mean, we really do collectively, you know, we shoot ourselves in the foot that way, and 
you know, and I, I mean, you know, people, I think people look at, you know, you look at a guy like Ty Murray or some of the really successful rodeo guys, especially rough stock guys. Well, you know, it's easy to see that and look at it and think, man, that's got to be hard on your body. Well, I'm going to tell you what we do every day. It's hard on your body too. You don't realize it, you know, because, but, but when you, you know, so, you know, like, you know, especially for, you know, guys that are riding a lot of horses and if you're successful in our industry, you're going to ride a lot of horses, you know, over time it takes its toll and, you know, and, and, and it's really sad when you get to that point and, you know, you see, and I've seen it time and time again, you, you know, you see people that are, that have had a really good co- career and their bodies beat up and, you know, and they're struggling, they're not as good as they used to, but they can't quit because they, you know, they, they don't, they hadn't, they don't have the money to quit. And, and, you know, and, and it's sad it's that way, but, you know, but that's just kind of the way it's been. And, you know, I'm kind of like you, like, and I appreciate, you know, things like you're doing with this podcast and stuff like that. Like, hopefully I hope that changes, you know, maybe just through conversation and, you know, different ideas getting thrown around. But, you know, like, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, <clears throat> like I said, if you're in the West Western industry and you're successful, like, You've worked hard. You've put a lot of time in, and, you know, and you would hope that some of those guys that were the very best of what they did, you know, once their time had passed, didn't have to worry about how they were going to continue on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because it's almost heartbreaking, you know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. It's like when you see Mike Tyson get knocked out for the first time, you're like, God damn it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or something like that. When you see your heroes or, or legends, I mean, and it's the thing that scared me to stop training horses myself. Right. You know, I started putting pen to paper and calculating. I was like, there's no way. There's no way. Now, I was in the wrong industry and definitely didn't want to do it bad enough. But that's why I like to have that uncomfortable piece of the conversation with everybody who's successful from the different industries. Now, we've we've had that same thing come out of the mouth of pretty much every Western Western sport, and everybody says the same thing. Right. Now, now, also, you know, another part of that is, you know, like, you know, guys have got to be smart with the money they make. You know, that's, you know, that's part of it. And, and, and I like to think that a lot of people will tell you I'm the tightest person they know. I'm not. Winston Hansma is. But, uh, but you know, you, you've got to... You know, I, I guess what I'm saying, I, I like to think I haven't pissed a lot of money off, but I probably have some that I shouldn't have. Like, there's, you know, I've made some mistakes here and there, and, you know, but, you know, so, I mean, part of it, I mean, you know, there's some responsibility that belongs with us to be smart with the money we make, but, you know, the, it, I think we basically all o- operate with a poor business model yeah. as well. And it's just the business model you were handed down. Well, yeah. I mean, we've all just done what, you know, the way it was done before us. And and we all keep continuing on that same path and wondering why it hasn't changed. Yeah. You know, it, it's really, it kind of blows your mind when you think about it. You're like. When you break it down. You know, at some point, you got to get smarter. But, but, you know, like I said, it's hard to, it's hard for a guy to step out there and charge 2500 a month when. You know, you have somebody else that's winning just as much or more than you are, and he's charging thirteen hundred. Yeah. You know, well, why is that? Why are they going to send that horse to you for twice what I'm paying this guy? Yeah. You know, so I mean, exactly. it's. But. Yeah, it's it's <clears throat> just one of those topics that's. It's really easy to get on a tangent and talk about it, but it's like, how do we fix? Yeah, this? how do you fix it? Yeah. Yeah, and the only thing I can figure is expose it, keep exposing it. That's yeah. the only thing I can figure out. Well, I mean, I mean, I think I think we have to realize there's there's more value in what we do than we think there is. Yeah, there is. You know, I mean, and I think it starts with that, like recognizing your own value. Exactly. Right. right. 
Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, if it's coming from you and it's coming from these other people, I think it's, it's a topic that just needs to keep being pushed, but uh, I'm super, super happy. You sat down here and you just, you laid out some really amazing stuff that people are going to get huge value out of. I think there's so much more value in talking about the stuff that we just talked about than saying, well, this is the, my favorite show I went to, and this was how I took this horse to this. And it's like, you can say that in an interview after you right. won, but here you're laying out principles that people can take and value that they can get from you and apply to their own life. Right. Well, Which, like I said, there's nowhere else you can really get that. And it's, it's really amazing that, uh, that you were willing to come and do that. Well, and like you said, I mean, it, you know, it really is. And I don't, you know, whatever industry you're in, you know, it's, it's a process and, and yeah, and it's, and it's, it's a continual fight and, you know, and I, I think people just need to, real, you know, need to realize that, you know, there is. And for the ones that I, I think I think what we're talking about, is, you know, like especially for the ones that 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 really make it through that push through and are the best that they're in their field, you know, like I think there's more value there than we even think there is. You know, and, and, I think and it's the so, most valuable thing that the industry has to offer the, the world. Right, that, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it just it's such a level of of grit and work that goes into what you do or what other people do. The rest of the world doesn't actually understand. Like that, that's probably fifty percent to one hundred percent more effort than it takes to be wildly successful in business, from my experience. Because just the amount of work that you have to have before you ever see a reward is so much harder than, than other things. And then to hit the real monetary success like you, it's an even another level. Right. So if you can bottle up that and put it out to the world, how can it not help? Right. God knows we need more strength projected out into this pussy world that we're living <laughs> yeah, in, unfortunately. Sure. I mean, and who better to put it out there than, than this world, because you don't get that option. You have that mentality. You're working in Burger King next year. Well, I, I think you know, like I said, I think a lot of people don't really realize it. You know, the general public they don't they don't understand what you know the day in the life of a rodeo cowboy is or a horse trainer. Or, you know, I mean, they don't. You know, it's so so nobody really understands what that's. You know what that is like, the work that goes into it, and. You know, and like you said, you know, it's easy It's easy to talk about the wins and the big wins and all that stuff, but the real important thing is what it took to get there, to me. I, always. That, that's where the value lies. It is. It's not just that, yeah, I won the charity or I won the world or what, you know, it's, it's what it took to get to that point to make those things possible. That's where the value is. 100%. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's a, a mic drop right there. That can live in time forever because it's the realest thing there is. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. It was absolutely epic, and it, I mean, it's going to be out tomorrow. We turn them quick. Well, cool. So, yeah, I uh, I can't wait to see how people respond to it, but I know they're going to love it. Cause, yeah, well, I appreciate you all having me on, really, because like, I mean, I listen to it a lot. I've enjoyed a lot of the the shows I've listened to, and I think you're doing a great thing, and I, well, hope, I, appreciate you keep, I hope you keep it up. I'm not going to stop. Yeah, and good. Not as long as people like you keep coming on and putting good. the messages out there. That's that's the key. People need to hear them, and they need to hear them from people like you. And you're you're a, uh, a fantastic champion and a scholar, my man. So thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gauge on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gauge wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.